What's up guys? Hey, future respiratory therapist, on your way to be a respiratory therapist, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. I saw a Twitter post the other day. It was, it literally said, can we stop using the word future to describe where we're going? And I thought to myself, no, we can't. If you are on your way to being a respiratory therapist, then call yourself a future respiratory therapist. I don't care what anybody thinks, and you shouldn't care either. You have to understand that, like, nobody's opinions should penetrate your dome, and they should affect you from achieving your goals, okay? So somebody says, can we stop saying future respiratory therapist and start saying aspiring respiratory therapist? No. Because aspiring respiratory therapist sounds sounds weird. Future respiratory therap therapist sounds exceptionally relevant. And you should be proud of yourself for being in a school and working towards becoming a respiratory therapist. So screw what all the haters say on whatever social network you're on. You're never going to make them happy and stop trying. <clears throat> now, I have... A question here from Alicia that wants to know about alarms, okay? And so we're going to talk real quick here about alarms. I'm going to break them down for you as simplistically as I can. There's a few of them that are very, 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 very important that your board exams are definitely going to ask you about. And then there's a few of them that you're going to need to be ready for for real-life application of respiratory therapy, okay? So the first one we're going to talk about is... Number one, that's your increase or your high peak pressure alarm. Okay? So your high peak pressure alarm, why would that alarm go off? Okay? Well, the most easy answer for this is if it's sudden. Okay? So let's just say that you have a patient with a peak pressure alarms coming in or your peak pressure is coming in at 20, 20, 20, and then all of a sudden they're coming in at 35, 35, 35, then you probably have an obstruction. Now, obstruction is a term that can be very, very um, widely applied, okay? So if you have an obstruction, then you may have a patient who's exhibiting sudden onset of bronchospasm. Um, a sudden onset of increased mucus production. They may be biting the tube. They may be coughing against the ventilator. Okay. This is going to give you first a peak inspiratory pressure alarm. Now, how do you fix it? You have to understand the problem. Is it secretions? Then you suction your patient. Is it bronchospasm? Then you give a bronchodilator. Is it the patient's biting on the endotracheal tube? Then you put a bite block in or you sedate your patient. Okay, now I'm a fan of not sedating the patient at the first sign of asynchrony. Let your patient work through the initial sense of I don't like this and maybe put a bite block in. Okay, maybe it's them bucking the vent or coughing against the vent and you have no other options but to sedate the patient. And in that case, you sedate the patient. Now, what you need to know about the peak pressure alarm is that if it goes on long enough, the peak pressure alarm, and this is why I start with this one, it cuts off the delivered tidal volume. So it is also a safety mechanism. Okay, so if you hit your peak pressure alarm, your tidal volume is cut off when that peak pressure is, is hit. Okay, so if you have your, your tidal volume alarm set correctly, then you will also probably get subsequent to your peak pressure alarm, you will then get a low pressure alarm. Okay, Mo scratch that not a low pressure alarm, you may get a high peak pressure alarm and subsequently get a low tidal volume alarm. And if that happens long enough, it will eventually affect your low minute ventilation alarm because 
your peak pressure is cutting off your tidal volume. That's what makes peak pressure alarm unique. It's the only alarm that also functions as a limit, which means it's the only alarm that also won't allow the pressure to exceed it. Okay, that's a limit. The definition of a limit, okay, or what some call a target variable, which is a, a variable that cannot be exceeded. When you set your peak pressure alarm, you're saying do not let the peak pressure achieve this point. So when it hits 40, 35, 45, whatever you have it set at, when it hits that level, it will not exceed that level and it will terminate the breath, which means if only half of your tidal volume was delivered before that pressure was hit, then the rest of your tidal volume will not be delivered. Okay? So then you get a low tidal volume alarm and as that persists, then you ultimately get a low minute ventilation alarm, okay? Now, if you notice your peak pressure is rising slowly, like you're, let's say you come in and you're at 20, then you're at 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, and now you're at 35, which is where you have your alarm set, which is where it should be set, 10 to 15 centimeters above actual peak inspiratory pressure. If you started at 20 at the beginning of the shift, then your alarm should be set 30 to 35. Once you reach that alarm, it's going to cut the tidal volume off. Now, if it's slow to reach that alarm and slow rising, then it's probably a decrease in your compliances. Whether it's dynamic or static, it doesn't matter. But if it's slow to get there, then you probably have more of a slow rising static compliance issue such as a developing atelectasis, a developing pneumonia, um, something that's going to affect your alveoli state that's going to cause your peak pressure to slowly rise over time. And the next thing you know, you've gone from 20 to 34 and your pressure is cutting off at 35 and you go, oh, I got a peak inspiratory pressure alarm. You're right. And your tidal volumes will be cut off. And with time, as your lung compliance continues to decrease, the delivered tidal volume will be less and less. Your delivered minute ventilation will be less and less, and you will get those subsequent alarms, okay? So what do I do when I get a high peak inspiratory pressure alarm? First thing you do is assess your patient, okay? If they have coarse wheezing throughout, then you need to give a bronchodilator. If they have coarse crackles throughout, then you need to suction your patient. If they're biting the tube, then you need to put a bite block on. Okay. If they have worsening static or dynamic compliance, then you need to address the worsening compliance, whatever it may be. Okay. But those are some things you should be thinking about when you get your peak inspiratory pressure alarm. Now, we're going to flip the script here, okay? Because the number two alarm you may get is low tidal volume, okay? Which may also be subsequented by low peak pressure, okay? So if you're working with a ventilator, so I know the PB840s, they don't have a low pressure alarm. They have a low tidal volume, but they don't have a low pressure alarm, okay? So if you have, take the Avias for example, they have a high and a low pressure alarm, okay? So you're going to get multiple alarms here. So what I'm trying to point the picture to you for is, is if you have a patient that has a leak in their circuit, and you deliver the breath, and there's a leak, then it's just like the tires on your car. If you have a leak on your car, on your tire, on your vehicle tires, 
then you're gonna get an alarm or an indication on your on your in your dash that says low pressure on your tires, right? Same thing with mechanical ventilation. If the ventilator tries to give a breath and a pressure cannot be achieved, then there's probably a leak in the circuit somewhere. And you need to address that leak. Okay? You need to first find it. Now where do we where do we look for a leak? Right? Like, where do I start looking for this leak? The answer is this. You always start at your patient. So where would the first place a leak would show up on your patient? Now, if they have a pneumothorax and a chest tube in, then that would be the first place to look for a leak. Okay? The second place to look for a leak would be at the endotracheal tube cuff or the tracheostomy tube cuff. The next place to look for a cuff, I mean a leak, would be at the, the patient wire, the connector. And then you work back through the circuit at every single place where there's an opening or a possible place for a leak. Okay? So if you have a low tidal volume or a low inspiratory pressure, you're looking for a leak. Okay? That's the big thing you want to look for there. Okay? Now, another alarm you might get is a high respiratory rate. Okay? This is usually common during SBTs and the switch over from full mechanical ventilation to a spontaneous mode or just the winning of sedation will allow your patient to breathe more. Okay? Now what I want to tell you about high respiratory rate is simply this. Yes, your patient may be breathing fast. The question is why? Do they have a high minute ventilation demand? Maybe. Are they trying to compensate for a metabolic acidosis? Maybe. Okay? Ask yourself all these questions. Why would my patient be breathing 37 times a minute? Okay? Now, if your patient's on Nimbex, and they're paralyzed, and they're triggering the vent excessively, then you need to ask yourself, is my vent auto-triggering? Because that's a possibility. And what you need to look for is condensation in your circuit to make sure that the condensation is not creating an auto-trigger uh, situation. Okay? So drain the fluid in your circuit, and see what happens. Now the other thing you might see sometimes, which is very rare, but it does happen, is that the cardiac mechanism from the heart beating inside the thoracic cavity next to the mediastinum connected to the trachea can also create enough of a negative pull or a big enough pressure difference to auto-trigger your ventilator. And if that's the case, you need to go to pressure trigger and increase the pressure trigger until it stops. You'll be able to recognize this because it will be very rhythmic on your ventilator graphics. Okay? It won't be something that's just an occasional trigger. It'll be very rhythmic. You look at it, you go boom, boom, boom. Just look at your... Look, guys. And I tell... You just got to look at your stuff. And you just got to know what you're looking at. Okay? And when you see stuff that looks very rhythmic, little tracings on your pressure waveform that you go, what is that? You look at it and you look at the your, your ECG graphing on your, on your monitor and you go, that's funny, those two things match. Then guess what? You're, you're seeing pressure differences from your cardiac function. And yes, did you learn this in school? Probably not. Are you learning it now? I hope. Seriously, like, you just got to understand, like, these things happen. 
then you can go in and say, the patient's triggering an event. I don't know how. They've been declared brain dead. How are they triggering an event? Or you can be the person to say, they're not triggering an event. This is auto-triggering from a pressure difference in the hemodynamic status, and we've got cardiac triggering here, or we've got water in our circuit, or we've got something else happening. But the patient is not triggering the vent. Or perhaps the patient is. And you're the one that says, wait a second, maybe we're not brain dead. Maybe the patient is still neurologically initiating a breath. And I'm the expert and I know how to tell the difference. Okay? So you got to study this stuff. The only way you get to this point is by practice, 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 practice. You never stop looking at anything. And you stay active in it the entire time. I could talk to you guys about this for hours. I wish you guys were here in front of me right now. And we could video it. We could put a three-hour freaking tele-seminar on right now over this stuff right now. Get it? Like, it's that big of a deal. So, oh, well, my, my respiratory rate's going off. I don't know what the problem is. I don't know why it's triggering. Figure it out. You're the expert. Period. You're the expert. The next alarm you might get is a low peep alarm. Okay? Now, a low peep alarm might also be indicative of a leak in your system, anytime you can't hold pressure or achieve pressure, then it's probably a leak. But also on the low peep alarm, if your patient is, is, is initiating an excessive amount of pressure within the circuit, that it pulls the pressure down below your peep alarm. So let's say you're on a peep of five and you have your low peep alarm set at three and the patient initiates a negative pull of, of let's just say negative five, then you're gonna go from five to zero, that's gonna initiate your low peep. And what you need to do is make your ventilator more sensitive to your patient's efforts. Okay, that's it. You gotta make it more sensitive to your patient's efforts. Now, I've talked about a lot, I'm gonna recap here real quick. Anytime you have a high peak pressure, you're probably looking at, at some sort of obstruction that you need to fix. Bronchospasm, give a bronchodilator. Secretion, suction, okay? Biting in the tracheal tube, bite block, or perhaps sedate. Overall asynchrony with the ventilator and, and, and just not happy, then sedate, okay? Two, decreased tidal volume alarm along with the decreased pressure alarm, which means you're losing pressure, you're losing volume, you have a leak in your circuit, and you need to fix it. Okay, find the leak. Start at your patient. Chest tube, cuff, Y, work your way back. Okay, increased respiratory rate, always look for auto triggering to make sure it's your patient that's doing the triggering. A lot of times, excessive condensation in the tube will cause your vent to auto-trigger and give you a high respiratory rate. And the last one is a low peep. Make sure your patient's not pulling an excessive amount of negative pressure to initiate a breath. Make your vent more sensitive to your patient. I know I got on my soapbox there for a minute, guys, but look, it comes down to this. You or on your way to being the experts. I call you guys future respiratory therapists. I started this out with saying, screw everybody saying, don't call yourself future respiratory therapist. I agree, call yourself future cardiopulmonary experts and go be great.